Good morning. Today we will be talking to you about an analysis of a vehicle's cruise control as it travels through a dynamic environment. This project was prepared by myself, Brittany Fink, and Rubert Science. The overview of this project will include the motivation, introduction on cruise control, conventional versus adaptive, an overview of the system, and our objectives is the analysis of an auto automobile cruise control system in a dynamic environment. The motivation behind choosing the analysis of a cruise control system is that it is a system that most people use daily and therefore is often taken for granted by the general public. It is one of the most desirable luxury options on any vehicle to date and often comes standard on a wide variety of vehicle makes and models. The main function of any cruise control system is to maintain a constant preset vehicle speed despite road design and environmental effects on the vehicle. Manufacturers in recent years have advanced the system to maintain a preset distance between your vehicle and the vehicle in front of you. This advanced cruise control system also incorporates the braking system of the vehicle for obstacle and collision avoidance. This advanced system has become known as adaptive cruise control and is being offered as a standard equipment on many new vehicles coming off the lot. In a more sophisticated, in more sophisticated vehicles offered, these systems have advanced to incorporate lane assist and self-driving functions. For an introduction to the cruise control system, a brief description on the history will be discussed as well as an overview of the conventional cruise control systems, including the differences in components between earlier mechanical cruise control systems and modern electric cruise control systems. A brief introduction to adaptive cruise, con cruise control system will be covered along with an overview of the system. Conventional cruise control system primary function is to adjust throttle input of the vehicle to maintain a preset speed. The vehicle's instantaneous speed is constantly changing due to multiple factors while driving. These factors can include dampening force from headwind against the vehicle, change in grades of the incline and decline in the road, as well as change in the direction of the vehicle. Since there are multiple factors that can change the vehicle speed, the cruise control system falls under the class of a MIMO dynamic system. The term MIMO is an abbreviation meaning multiple inputs, multiple outputs. Mechanical cruise control systems use vacuum pressure and actuators to change the throttle position of the vehicle. In recent years, vehicles have adapted electronically cruise control systems. In this system, the throttle position is changed electronically with sensors, monitors, and engine management computers. In recent years, vehicle systems and controls have become highly sophisticated. Never vehicles are now offering adaptive cruise control. Adaptive cruise control, or ACC, uses forward-facing cameras and sensors that can detect the distance between vehicles in front of the pilot vehicle. This system not only maintains vehicle speeds, it also incorporates the braking system of the vehicle as well. If the forward-facing cameras or sensors detect that it is approaching a vehicle or obstacle too quickly, it will apply the brakes automatically to aid in avoidance of a collision. Our objective for this assignment is to model the cruise control system and its components such as a throttle speed sensor and the engine management to better understand how the equipment talks to each other. Also, we would like to analyze how changes in environment and road conditions affect the vehicle and how the cruise control system nearly instantaneously adjusts to these changes. The problem that we will be starting with includes our assumptions that are a fixed floor, an ideal damper, lumped mass point. It, the system will also be slipless and frictionless system and it'll be at equilibrium. So the problem we'll be analyzing today is an old truck going up an incline while experiencing headwind. This old truck weighs 1,700 kilograms, has a drag coefficient of 0.85, uh, traveling through air that is what has a density of 1.225 kilograms per meters cube. Uh, the wind acting on it is going moving at 15 meters per second, and the vehicle is traveling at 20 meters per second. Um, the hill that it is climbing is has a five degree grade, and it is a the length of the hill is 100 meters. Uh, with uh, since we know with our givens we can solve for our variables that we will need throughout the problem. Uh, we will need to solve for the uh, the force of the drag on the vehicle. Um, this is 
you gain this by multiplying the drag coefficient by the density of air by that reference area, which is normally the front of the vehicle, by the reference speed squared. This gave us a force of drag on the vehicle of 421.29 newtons. With our force of, with our drag force, we can calculate our B, which will be the dampening effect that we have on the vehicle. This is F drag over our reference speed. This gives us a dampening coefficient of 21.064 newton seconds per meter. We have a spring constant acting on the system in the form of the incline on the vehicle. This is solved by mg sine theta of the hill over the length of the hill. This gives us a spring constant of 14.535 newtons per meter. And lastly, we will need the force of the headwind acting on the vehicle. Uh, this is calculated similar to the drag force or on the vehicle. Uh, we just change the reference velocity to the velocity of the wind giving us a U-force of 236.975 Newtons. Uh, before we can start using our variables, we have to put them in a functional function. Uh, this is our transfer function. Um, basically, the force, of the, uh, the force needed to overcome the disturbance is the summation of the forces in the X direction. So from this, we get MX double dot plus BX dot plus kx is equal to u. After taking the Laplace transform on both sides, we end up with our transfer function x of s over u of s or g of s, which equals 1 over ms squared plus bs plus k. With our transfer function though, we can uh, start plugging, uh, we can find out our state space variables. So uh, solving for the state the state space variables, uh, we achieve an A matrix of 0, 1, negative K over M, negative B over M, a B matrix of 0 over 1 over M, a C matrix of 1, 0, and a D matrix of 0. From uh, following our transfer function, we can also find our frequency characteristics um, as you can see, our transfer function g of s is equal to kdc wn squared over s squared plus 2 zeta natural frequency s plus wn squared. And the reason why we can use this is because in a, at the end, our zeta is equaled out to under 1. Uh, in order to ca uh, calculate for our uh, dc gain, zeta, and natural frequency, we will need to use our M, B, and K values, which uh, were either given or calculated previously. Um, after plugging them in into the equations on the right, we achieve a DC gain of 0 0.069, a zeta of 0 0.067, and a natural frequency of 0 0.092. Uh, using our frequency characteristics, we can approximate our uh, open loop step response. Um, these, um, the settling time can be approximated using the equation 4 over zeta natural frequency, which approximate a settling time of 448.93 seconds. Uh, we can also estimate our rise time, which is 1.8 over the natural frequency. Uh, we estimated a rise time of 19.57 seconds. Um, we can also estimate our maximum overshoot. This is supplied by the equation e to the negative zeta pi over the square root of one minus zeta squared. Uh, plugging this in, we get a maximum overshoot of 81%. Um, our values are a bit off from the graph as labeled, but uh, they, were, they are approximations uh, in themselves. So uh, they weren't gonna be. Uh, now that we have our open loop uh, uh, step response, we go into our bode and zero, uh, pole zero map. Uh, from our bode plot, we have a peak gain at negative 5.77 decibels. Uh, on our pole zero map, we have two poles located at negative 0 0.006 plus, plus or minus 0.09. Uh, and we have no zeros on the map since there are no S uh, values in our numerator of the transfer function. 
So we only have two poles and no zeros. Um, here we have the, ro the root locus, uh, which also just states that we have two poles and no zeros. Um, these poles have gains of 1.37 and a gain of zero on the same one. From our transfer function, we start designing a negative feedback loop. This is so that we can imp start implementing controllers and designing controllers. Uh, our negative feedback loop, the general equation is C of S equals K G of S times H of S, one plus K G of S H of S. Uh, this is a unity function, so our H of S equals one. And I stated before, our transfer function G of S is one over M S squared plus B S plus K. So plugging in our values for M as well as the, the equation for the general uh, negative feedback loop, we achieve our negative feedback loop, C of S equals K over 1700 S squared plus 21.06 S plus 14.5 plus gain K. From our negative feedback loop, we plug into root stability of Root stability analysis is, a, is ideal for many reasons. Uh, primarily, it achieves a maximum overshoot of 25% and a steady state error of 2%. Uh, the function for roof stability is basically the denominator of the, uh, the negative feedback loop that we calculated. So F of S is going to equal one plus KG of S, H of S, and set it equal to zero. Uh, plugging in our values for G of S, H of S, and K, we achieve a final uh, root stability function, F of S, which is equal to 1700 S squared plus 21 S plus 14.5 K uh, equals zero. From this function, we we, uh, we can set it into our general equation and start populating the, the array, the roof stability array. Uh, as you can see, uh, our, the A0, A1, and A2 values coincide to the coefficients that are on our F of S function. So A0 is equal to 1700, A1 is equal to 21.064, and A2 is equal to 14.535 plus K. Uh, we do need to solve for B1. This can be solved by multiplying A2 times A1 minus A0 all over A1. So plugging in for B1, we achieve, we get a value of K minus 66.171, and we start populating our array. Um, the idea behind roof stability array is that it can be determined the system is stable whenever every value in the second column uh, doesn't experience a, say, a sign change. So they all have the same sign. Our system will remain stable as long as K, our, our K, our gain, is greater than 66.171 or equal to. Uh, at 66.171, it is zero, which give, will give us a neutral stability. Our neutral stability uh, is equal, equals our critical gain which is 66.171. Uh, with uh, following our critical gain, we need to solve for our critical period. Uh, this can be solved um, using uh, the neutral stability function by plugging in the critical gain. This gives us a critical period of 29 seconds after you subtract the times from two of the magnitudes. So we have a critical period of 29 seconds. Uh, now that we know our critical gain and critical period, we can start designing, we can begin our controller design. Uh, here we have, this is just a general layout of a PID controller. Uh, basically you have your controller on the left um, and it feeds into your transfer function on the right and it has a negative feedback loop that goes around. So, our critical gain and our critical period come into play when we start solving with Ziegler-Nichols, okay? And the Ziegler-Nichols equations help us determine the proportional gain, the integral time, the derivative time, the integral gain, and the derivative gain. Uh, 
the P controllers only use uh, a, a proportional gain. A PI controller uses both proportional and integral gain, and a PID uses all three, proportional, integral, and derivative gain. Uh, all these can be solved using the critical gain and the critical period. So we plugged in uh, solving for our three controller designs. We ended up with our P, PI, and PID standard controllers with those values. And we were not, uh, we weren't happy with the outcomes that, as you can see, none of them settled in time. Uh, they, uh, they go on for 100 seconds and they never reach uh, final speed and um, there's too much variation. So from here, we decided to try a PESN integration to try and bring down the overshoot and help it settle faster. Um, the idea is basically the same as the Ziegler-Nichols method. You use the critical gain and the critical period to uh, obtain these value, obtain the values of the proportional gain, the integral time, the derivative time, the integral gain, and the derivative gain. Um, as you can see from our graph, we the PESN integration did help mitigate a lot of the issues we had, but it still wasn't ideal for the application that we were trying to achieve. So from here, we went to advanced tuning using MATLAB, the PID tuner, and basically played around for with it for a little bit. We wanted to we needed to make it react faster while also making it act more aggressively so that it could um, compensate and could level out ideally. So the uh, values we came up uh, determined to finalize were a proportional gain of 412.9, an integral gain of 25.01, and a derivative gain of 17, uh, 1704. These are the references that we used for our project. And thank you so much for listening to our presentation. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you.